So, uh, George, we would like to ask you to introduce yourself and to tell us how uh, your ideas uh, developed along with your uh, development as an activist. Um, so, can you give us a, a bit of an introduction to that? Sure. I, I come from a, a generation of the 1960s in the United States. And my first uh, experience of struggle uh, was to be found in the civil rights movement of the early 60s. I was a, a student in the universities at that time. And uh, I went on many demonstrations, especially for the rights of African Americans. Because there was a, I, I think it would be important for us to say that the 60s movement experienced a, a revolution, actually, within the United States. Um, it's an unfinished revolution because the demands that were put forward have not have legally been approved, but in actual fact, there's still a substantial struggle to be made. And uh, for me, it was the, the the beginning where I got arrested a number of times around demonstration. Uh, issues, and uh, I was able to study the first experiences of organization, both in the United, in in New York City, where I was born and brought up, and in Ohio, and in fact in Southern Ohio, which was more or less a segregated place, and. Uh, well, from that beginning, I immediately went into the anti-war, Vietnamese War story. And uh, it was there that I began to look for some theoretical basis for my activism. And uh, it was time in the mid-60s when there was a a revival of Marxism. And here is something I, I'd like to say something about, because uh, there's a certain kind of uh, deter determinism about past experiences that is not accurate. Uh, because in the 1950s, preceding the revolutionary upsurge in the United States, the it was a, the, one of the most reactionary times in American history. And everybody predicted that, every, that the students who were going through high school and college at that time would come out to be robots, uh, right-wing robots, speaking the reactionary lines. But in fact, it turned to be the exact opposite. At least, not only I, but so many, literally millions of young, young folks who have been told that McCarthy is a great guy and uh, that uh, the uh, capitalism is the best way to organize society. Uh, these young people who came out of the colleges and universities at that time did not end up becoming these little right-wing robots. On the contrary, we joined the revolutionary movement in the southern part of the United States. And not only the southern part, but actually throughout the country to demand that there be fundamental change. And uh, so as a consequence, uh, I began to study with comrades uh, the works of revolutionaries before us. And uh, I, at that time, became part of study groups 
which were very much part of the education of uh, uh, young, young activists and militants. Um, and it was in that route that I began to develop my ideas. It's a long story, but maybe I, I, I hopefully I gave you some sense of what happens in the 1960s that eventually led to the kind of politics that uh, I ended up with and still adhere to. Uh, in maybe you can talk a little bit also about uh, you know the encounter more with also some Italian, uh, the work on zero work and uh, the encounter with some of the theories that were coming out of Italy in the 1960s, late 60s, early 70s. <clears throat> yes, I can talk about it mm -hmm. because it was a very important part of my... Uh, because what happened was that uh, the kind of theory that I be begin to develop with others in the 19, late 60s, early 70s, was a very uh, orthodox, if you want to call it that, Marxism uh, of the time. And uh, I began to, in the, in the early 70s, I began to question some of the, the principal um, ideas that were coming out of the communist movements and the socialist movements of the, of the time. And I began to look for other sources of theoretical uh, depth. And to do that, I came upon the work of um, Sylvia and uh, a number of other comrades from Italy that had uh, found their way to New York City and uh, who were part of the radical scene of the 1970s. And uh, their their way of interpreting Marx struck me as ma making a lot of sense. Because what happened was that in the 1960s in Italy, there was an attempt to create a, an understanding of Marxism that begins to look at the working class not as a, uh, a fixed and given entity, but actually were, was... A, a dependent variable of development. That was the word, not as a dependent variable of development. <laughs> and in the process, uh, in studying this non-dependent and autonomous conception of the working class, we began to also enter into the development of some important ideas in the Wages for Housework campaign. So if you want to put it this way, if we're going to kind of shake things out, the political thinking that affected me at this time was uh, a combination of the workerist interpretation of Marx in the 1960s that came from Italy and uh, the work of Sylvia and others. and others around the Wages for Housework campaign that brought together to the first theoretical break of that time for me, 
which was the development of the ideas around uh, zero work, which attempted to bring wages for housework and the workerist streams that were developing at this time. And uh, so this leads to my, uh, the point of my own development that is much more continuous. So we, we would like to ask you about uh, your concept <coughs> of uh, work energy, work slash energy. You insist in keeping these two uh, words or these two concepts together. Can you explain us that how, how what's uh, what 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 are you aiming at by keeping these two ideas together? Well, uh, the ideas of, of the work energy, um, work slash energy, was developed by uh, comrades and myself in the early 1980s uh, to first deal with uh, the notion of an energy crisis. I, I and others in my group that had formed in the journal of um, the, the midnight notes, midnight notes would be responding to the attempt to understand the crisis of the late seventies as a result of an energy crisis, and so we felt that. That was not an adequate way of understanding the situation. We were looking at an attempt to bring together the notions of Marxism with the theoretical developments of the workerist and uh, and the Wages for Housework campaign, bring them all together and uh, develop a conception of what the crisis is, was involving not energy, because energy as a physical quality was endless, but the crisis of the 1980s that capitalism was facing involved a, uh, a work crisis, the ability to use energy to extract surplus value from the working class of the time. And as a consequence, it was a, not a crisis of energy, but a crisis of how much work could be gotten from a particular type of arrangement of energy production. And this, this began a process of re-understanding what was a uh, very important characteristic of capitalism, which is that if the work that can be developed out of a particular energy structure begins to fall, if that ratio becomes less and less um, profitable, yeah, profitable, then there would be a crisis of, of a serious nature, which would require 
a change in the energy foundations of a work regime which capitalism needs to use to replace an older relationship between energy and work. So, for example, the transition from coal to oil as being the uh, central kinds of uh, energy that are being used. When miners, coal miners around the world began to become rejection of capitalism, which was increasingly sh beginning to appear, then the shift from coal to oil was pushed ahead to create a new relationship between energy and work. And we began to look at the various kinds of transitions that have occurred and the other kinds of transitions that didn't occur. So, for example, the energy crisis of going from coal to oil was, was a successful one, and far from over, by the way. But the, the transition that was supposed to take place... From the capitalist viewpoint. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> um, but um, I would uh, say that the assumption that there would be another transition from oil to nuclear power had, has not uh, been successfully concluded. Uh, and uh, it was very important for us to point out that if you want to understand the crises that are taking place in, this, in the 20th centuries, you have to see them as transitions to different kinds of relationships between energy and work. So could you say that uh, you know, one, another way of putting it is you know, showing that the whole issue of energy is connected with class struggling in terms of more traditional terms, that you can understand the so-called energy crisis without connecting it to a whole process of struggles that uh, you know, are essential in determining the crisis. Yes, as usual, Sylvia, you, you put your uh, finger on an excellent way of describing Well, I've read your work. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there, there's a lot of... <laughs> there's a lot of work that has come out of this this energetic connection. Um, so it would be the beginning of um, understanding. I think it's a very rich concept. And uh, it's only now that it's beginning to be understood, I think. And uh, you're going to beginning, you're beginning to see the notion of work energy as being used more often so, I hope this helps. Yeah. Um, in, in relation to that, we would like to ask you about <coughs> uh, the notion of refusal of work and uh, how it relates to uh, valorization, creation of value. In particular, mm -hmm. you, uh, part of your work is on machines and how a uh, relative surplus value uh, is a result of a, of a previous struggle against uh, absolute uh, surplus value. Uh, so, uh, what's the, the, the place of, of uh, the refusal of work in the creation of value in capital? If you can elaborate on that, and how it relates to, to machines and, and the different generations of machines. Well, let's see. The most important first response is to point out that work is not 
for work for capitalism is not a natural state of being. Uh, that when you look at capitalism and its roughly 500 years of history, you see class struggle continually finding itself revealed in many different guises and uh, having many different forms. So, for example, there is a, an important uh, refusal of work that takes place in the conditions under which capitalism was involved with extensive slavery. Uh, it was also important to understand that the struggle against slavery was not only the product of some gentlemen in London working with uh, the parliament, but the slave rebellions which took place all over the planet in the 18th and 19th, early 19th centuries that was the basis of the end of formal slavery. And uh, this point is very important. First, for just uh, getting your orientation in history, of beginning to understand why things happen, why, why capitalism changes, is because, and this is the refusal of work, that you don't understand fundamental changes in capitalism unless you see them as responses to important changes within the working class itself. And uh, this is not a, this, this very simple methodological point is now beginning to be uh, taken seriously by many scholars of capitalism. So, and, but then there's the, there's the point about the relationship between refusal of work and it's, and the way it gets expressed in It get, well, let's see, it gets, I'm trying to find them. That if you want to understand what the value of work comes from, it has its deep roots in the ability of workers to say no. That's an essential <coughs> part of the value producing valorization process. Can you explain that? In, in what way saying no produces value? In what sense? Right? Can you go elaborate that a little bit more? It's only when, yeah, it's only when capitalism faces the fact that work is not an automatic uh, process that it begins to value. It's only when workers begin to be able to say no to work that the work itself becomes valuable. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I think it's an important point methodologically. And uh, it gives a sense of what it is to create value. What is essential about the creation of value is not that it's, uh, you create beautiful things or useful things but that you are able to see that the production process is being run by beings who can say no to the production process. If that was not there, then work would become totally machine production. And the difference between machines and human beings 
would be lost. So the refusal of work, getting back to, becomes an essential part of the valorization process. Of the degree to which labor, the process of exploitation, it's organized. Yes. In and I think it's uh, an important, for me, it, it changed my understanding. The, the, there's one, here's a couple of steps here. One is that one of the famous insights that we get from reading Marx is that we begin to see human labor behind the commodity form and the value of the commodities coming from human labor. And that changes everything. We begin to understand why there's a particular screw that takes place that's being used to keep this piece of machinery stable. And, the, and I'm just using this as a just throw away. Everything was decided by somebody to say that the screw goes clockwise instead of counterclockwise, mm -hmm. right? And that, that insight is, an, is more than enough for many to say, wow, this world is, that, that, that surrounds us with all the little different aspects of life. And we see that that, that's, uh, that's one of the great contributions in Marxism to our understanding of class struggle. But then there's another part. That it's not that Marx was not understanding of it, but did not make it central to his analysis, which was and is the part that not only is the decision to make that particular screw go clockwise, but also the ability of the workers and the designers of this particular piece of machinery um, who are able to say no to the process of this labor that takes place and that puts into action the forging of this particular little piece of machinery. Which then requires a whole area, a whole regime of, of yes. organization of work, of exploitation, etc. It's, a, it's, it's a, a side of things that also is exciting. So I, in my post-Orthodox um, Marxism situation, I began to have two conceptual revolutions, one in the early 70s, where I began to study Marxism and the labor, what's called the labor theory of value. Uh, and then add to that labor theory of value the ability for workers to refuse to work. And this opens up the, another question, which has to do with uh, the development of um, machines. Machines, yes. And the recognition that machinery is the, if we want to understand where they come in, has to do with the response to workers' struggles. These struggles are what make things change and lead to changes in machinery and also the energy that drives these machines. And they come in response to refusal of work, which is a way of speaking about class struggle that brings out the elements the essential elements of capitalism and what we describe as the class struggle. Okay. Um.
question we have um, is uh, about a concept that in, in, in some way it puzzled us uh, when reading it because it's difficult to translate into Spanish. Um, the idea of uh, the manifold of work mm. that uh, you talk about in, in at least in, in two of your books. Uh, so we would like to know what, what, what do you mean by the manifold of work? Uh, what's the uh, the the relationship between the different kinds of work and and this sort of uh, uh, form of funneling work uh, towards uh, capitalist accumulation? Yes, the manifold of work is a term that I'm not sure who exactly used it first, uh, but. Um, there's a point behind it, which is to say that work that is essential for understanding capitalism and the class struggle is not something that takes place alone in a factory. There's not one form of work. And um, the, this, this conception of work that we developed in the early 1980s, we called manifold of work, is the fact that much work takes place in areas where the word work was never used to. And so, for example, much of the work that in, is involved in the reproduction of workers and this is a point that Sylvia's made. No, not Sylvia, the women's movement. The women's movement. <laughs> Sylvia yes. through the women's movement, mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, Sylvia through the women's movement. And uh, others, Sylvia and, and others through the others. women's movement. Yeah. <clears throat> Pace. See. Yes. Uh, and also cognitive work, for example, the work of cognition, etc., which is usually traditionally yeah, been more recognized yeah. but it has work. yes yeah. student work exactly yeah. in fact George was very involved in the whole uh, struggle about um, wages for students yes saying and in Italy too there was a whole movement pre salario mm -hmm. right saying uh, studying is work because we don't study because we like it but you're forcing us to take a degree in order to become more productive workers. So we are working already in preparing ourselves for future work. So we should be entitled to remuneration and to be supported economically. And it's been a big defeat in the United States when in fact they have forced uh, students to pay. It's like paying you know, to prepare yourself to be exploited or to prepare yourself to be more productive. So yeah. The work has many, but I think it's important this concept that it work, the manifold refers to forms of work that were never recognized as work. Yes, and it's the, the most important example is the reproductive work that takes place in preparing workers, both generationally and daily, to return to work. And... Uh, it's very much a, a, a manifold. Uh, it has many different forms of work. And that uh, we begin to expand in the 1970s and into the 80s so that we begin, for example, to see that is a tremendous amount of work that takes place. In fact, most of the work of the planet takes place in trying to get, in creating a new generation of workers. And we Sex begin. work, emotional work. This, um, yeah, raising of children, <laughs> all of that. It's a vast area of work. I think that uh, the women's movement has really contributed immensely to showing the manifold of work.
but it, it also helps explain the relationship between uh, the, the work that creates value in the upper levels of capital and in the lower levels, like the, right. the higher composition, the uh, organic composition and the lower The transfer, yeah, maybe you can talk about that. Maybe, yes. if, like, would it be interesting if you can explain how you, there's a, <coughs> a, a sentence that I can never forget that you you write something like uh, the in order to have a cyborg we need a slave. Mm. Uh, so right. I think that's an interesting idea. Like if you if you could elaborate on that. Yeah, the the high level, uh, the sectors are high level exploitations suck up from other what you call the transfer problem. Yes, mm. the, there's one of the things that. Uh, I myself begin to take seriously after recognizing that there's been a tremendous hidden work that, that takes place uh, and is not used and is not referred to as work as for example the work that goes into bringing up a child for example so we began to see that the formal work that is presented as real work is waged work that is openly recognized by workers and capitalists in often legal the, there are laws that tell us what is legally considered work or not whereas in, for, in fact there's a tremendous amount of work that is not understood as work but in fact is essential for the creation of surplus value. Okay, now here, hold on to your hats. And here we go to the very important, I think, uh, use that the concept of organic composition can be used to understand the nature of capitalism and why Capitalism is such a subtle system where so much is hidden from us. So much is, tra is, a, is a matter of transformation. In fact, at this time, at the time of um, the writing of, of Capital by Marx, I counted there were 23 chapter and chapter titles that include the notion of transformation, of which, of course, the transformation of value into prices is the, con is the most well-known one. But if you open up a volume of capital, volume one, you'd see that there's a tremendous number of other uses of the term transformation. And uh, it's this transformation that creates a, a level of um, hiddenness in the system so that if you try to follow where this particular work takes place and how its value is created, and where it ends up in the system, you see it's not an easy process. It's not a direct process. Most commodities have value that is not equivalent to the amount of labor that goes into the production mm. of that commodity. Mm. And it's, uh, it's very important to say, to look into where does it go? Because this, it's, it's this fact that makes it difficult for us to understand where, where the uh, particular form of labor that goes into the production of commodity gets 
transformed into other parts of the system. And uh, a simple way, a simple way of understanding that is by using the classic Marxist conception of organic composition of constant capital, which is a technical way of saying that if you want to understand machines, if you want to understand ca the capitalist system as a whole, you have to see that the commodities that are being produced with a, a lot of machinery and very little human labor, as you can see in, uh, for example, in the platforms that are used for the extraction of oil from ocean, from the oceans. When we see that 20 or 30 men and a few women uh, would work in a platform that is used for extracting oil in the sub-ocean uh, localities are, have a very high organic composition, whereas the work of, for example, the workers in the coal mines of Britain in the time of Marx would have a very low organic composition. Can I maybe um, um, use this example to, 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 to nail down the concept? Because it seems to me that, you know, in your work, the, you have used over and over the, you know, the way oil companies, the whole oil industry extracted, it's accumulating surplus, right? It's in fact been one of the richest um, uh, enterprises, capitalist enterprises in the planet. Um, it's accumulating. It's a good example of this transfer, right? Because it employs very few workers. And so, in many ways, it's a kind of an enigma how they're accumulating so much surplus if they actually employ, relatively speaking, very few workers. Whereas, I think much of your work has shown that, yes, because of this transfer, that labor is in, a, in capitalism is often transferred from sectors with a very low level of technological development into the sectors who have a higher level of technological development, which basically have the capacity to extract and to force this transfer. So that, for example, the oil companies uh, accumulate an immense amount of value, not because of the labor on the platform, on the oil rig, but accumulate the labor and the surplus value from all the people who are paying for electricity bills, who every time, for instance, there is an, an increase, they have to work more to pay for the new gas bill, electricity bill, et cetera, et cetera. So they have millions of little spots, you know, a little restaurant, a little kitchen, a little, with a very low, low level of, and yet, nevertheless, you know, I mean, you have talked many times that we are all the oil workers proletariat. That the oil workers proletariat is not only the people are working on their eggs, because we are all paying all our labor in, in so far as we are paying gas bills, electricity bills, all of this. We are all contributing to the accumulation of the oil companies. And this again shows that, you know, the point you were making now, that in capitalism, it's very deceptive where the surplus value is coming from. It doesn't necessarily come 
right, from the labor that produces a particular commodity immediately, right? But behind the labor that produces this commodity, there is a whole other, yeah, which also, in my view, I, I mean, I've thought about, um, I've applied the concept also to the question of housework, for instance, that, uh, you know, the accumulation of surplus value by in any particular place of work. It's not dependent only on the labor that is done by those particular workers, but it's dependent on also by the reproductive work that is done in the kitchen, in the bedroom, in the communities, etc., etc., in the schools. And so that the, yeah, that we tend to have a very mechanical view of the way you know, capitalism accumulates wealth and value. Uh, that in fact it's much more complicated and it's not so localized mm -hmm. and that's why in a way the struggle it's, it's a struggle that really it's more and more difficult to to win you know by by when it is localized yeah um, but anyway, I didn't... As usual. Yeah. No, uh, but when you talk about how organic composition, I think it's also, there is something in Marx that the sectors with higher level of organic composition have this capacity to suck, to draw labor from other sectors. You know, that's why, you know, then in order to have a, a nuclear worker, you need to have a slave. In order to have an industrial worker, you need to have... And that, that sounds very, very interesting because then the whole question right, of hierarchies and ideologies that are justifying they are hierarchical, right? You can see like racism and sexism as also ways of hiding, right? This transfer. Hiding this transfer, yes, as ways not only of keeping people divided, creating antagonism, etc., but also as part of a machinery of uh, hiding, of occultation. Okay. Oh, yes. Yeah. Right. We're speaking in, yes. I think that... Uh, uh, yeah. Of yeah, this is well, well, well put, and I, I think that it's important for us to understand this point for, for all sorts of struggles. Uh, and to look at uh, the the kind of alliances that are possible, mm -hmm. right? Instead of beginning to look at this is my work and I'll struggle around this particular piece of the pie, without recognizing that there's actually a, a much larger struggle that the capitalists are fighting, mm -hmm. and uh, so it's it's very important that we understand and be able to integrate pieces of Marxism with other parts, other ways, and new, new concepts that are important. And that uh, we can begin to integrate into the 21st century, because it took a little time for, it took about 40 years, I think, mm -hmm. for these ideas to begin to enter into the mainstream. And now, I mean, even our gathering here this morning is an example of the increasing interest in these ideas. And uh, hopefully, at least I have the hope. Yeah. No, but I mean, there's a new understanding that coloniality, racism, sexism are not, you know, then it's not like. What is the relation with the class struggle, which has been the traditional conception, right? As if they were outside of it, as if they had nothing to do with exploitation of labor and were something else, right? And now that in fact coloniality, for example, as an essential structural dimension of capitalism, or racism being an unpaid labor, slave labor, forced labor being all essential structural elements of capitalism. That I think is becoming much more part of, of the general discourse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So our next question is uh, in relation to the category of neoliberalism. Mm 
You don't use much this uh, category. We would like to, if you can explain us why. Are you not interested in talking about neoliberalism or, or you have other ways of explaining the same phenomenon that probably add some more nuances to, to the problem, to explaining the problem? Well, it's not that uh, I'm not interested in this notion, but uh, I wanted to, uh, I've dealt with the notion of neoliberalism under a different title, which is capitalism. In other words, uh, as far as I understand what neoliberalism is, is the attempt to totalize the concepts of the liberal tradition of the 18th century and 19th centuries. Um, it was the attempt to presumably say that uh, commodities ought to be free, free, freely exchanged, but there were limits as to what could be freely exchanged. And uh, what neoliberalism, as far as I understand it, is, is an attempt to totalize. It's to say that all forms of transactions are really commodity transactions so that the state operates as a purveyor of particular kinds of commodities. And that, uh, in a way, what neoliberalism is about is to say that all forms of social interactions are are basically commodities. And uh, so mercenaries. Mercenary. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, commodities, but so there's this uh, a similarity between the the concept of of neoliberalism with the notions that we developed, but with a very different meaning and a very different consequence. Capitalism is neoliberalism, and that's why, in a way, it's not been our... Uh, is a totalizing capitalism. Yeah. And, and also the concept of the new enclosure, it's also part of that, that uh, the, it's, it's, part of, it's been part of the categories that has been used to describe this new form, this new phase of capitalism the, that, um, you know, whereas generally the accent is placed on neoliberalism, you know, also this new phase, also you and also I've been used a lot the notion of the new enclosure. Yes, yes that's, it's, that's a very important part of the way in which we've developed concepts in the 1990s. And it's, it's important for us to understand it because we see that there's a relationship between the, the development of the expulsion of people from the means of production and the means of reproduction as an essential part of the creation of a society in which all forms of life are commodified. Right. Yeah, we could talk about enclosure of also 
and not only land, but enclosure of social relations, urban spaces, so, bodies, etc. So this has been a way in which you, we've been another way of describing the class struggle, because <coughs> on the one side is a commodification that is called neoliberalism, and on the other side we we develop the notion of the commons as being the uh, what in fact is being struggled over. This is a very, uh, I think it'd be a, it's been a useful way of understanding the, the way class struggle operates. And uh, the new forms of antagonism and the new forms of changing social relations. And, uh, uh, and as a consequence also the struggles around the commons because we, we hearken back to the origins of capitalism. Now we use a term that Marx uses, but in a different and more generalized fashion of the new enclosures. So our next question was precisely about uh, commons and enclosures. Uh -huh. um, Maybe we can divide the question in two parts. On first, we would like to ask you about uh, the history of this discussion, uh, because well, Marx talks about uh, the legislation of uh, that uh, it begins to create enclosures in, in Britain and elsewhere uh, in, in the first part of capital. Uh, and there's uh, the discussion of primitive accumulation in the Grundrisse. Uh, we, we would like to ask you how this uh, discussion reappears or resurfaces in the 80s or, or around the 80s. And uh, because it, it, it is a, a very important uh, point in, 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 uh, in the in your work and also in the work of, of Sylvia and of Peter Leinbaugh, other people that are related to, to you. Um, so we would like to ask you how, how it appear, reappears uh, in, uh, after so many years. And also the, the second part of the question would be, uh, how can we relate today, uh, this is more of a what is to be done question, uh, what, how can we relate today the struggle for higher wages or the working class struggles to the struggles for both keeping the commons and commoning, like creating new commons? More so, uh, <coughs> that you, you in, in somewhere you say that one way, that a way of relating these two struggles could be uh, finding alliances between uh, working class struggles and the community and solidarity economics, like uh, eco the economics based on, on cooperatives or uh, different sorts of commons. Um, more so uh, taking into account that uh, on this is a, a dispute with, with the, the way capital uh, leads Consumerism towards the big brands and to other kinds of uh, like away from from this uh, uh, commons-based economics. Mm. So, how, how the first question? Would, the first part of the question is a, a little bit of history of, of the commons enclosures discussion, and the second part would be how to uh, uh, how can we use this uh, struggle for the commons. And, uh, in relation to uh, class struggle, other forms of class struggle. Okay. Um, let me just say that the concept of primitive accumulation, it's not exactly a Marxist co concept. Marx s says that uh, this is a concept that was developed by Adam Smith. And, uh, and it involved 
a particular kind of accumulation of capital that took place in order to satisfy the essential conditions for the development of capitalism. And uh, Marx develops the notion of primitive accumulation to point out that this process of satisfying the initial conditions for the creation of a capitalist society uh, is rooted in a tremendous violence that um, took place in, in Britain in the 18th century and uh, basically was a way in which the means of production were, uh, were taken away from the agricultural proletariat of the previous historical period. And uh, instead of talking about enclosures and of the time of the 17th and 18th centuries, um, it, w it was discussed as a form of satisfying the conditions for capitalism to take off. The claim is that um, it was a one-time affair. It happened once, capitalism was shaped, and primitive accumulation is done for. What we did is to say that uh, the process of primitive accumulation, the violence that goes into it, is uh, an ongoing process. And there's been a big debate about this in different venues in, in this last 20 years or so. And uh, what we, we, I and others have said is that whenever capitalism enters into a crisis, there is a, uh, a period of primitive accumulation because the crises are usually the result of efforts by the working class and successful efforts to reduce the commodification of their lives. And as a consequence, the new enclosures are forever, as long as capitalism exists, there's always a moment of primitive accumulation to deal with the crisis. See, and it's in, so what we're saying, and we use these terms uh, to hearken back to the earlier phase of capitalism and to say that capitalism never loses its youth, you might say. And I would add that uh, we use those terms also because starting in the 80s, we almost saw it developing under our own eyes. You know, yeah, both George and I were in Africa, for example. I mean, George much longer than I, but we saw, you know, in the early 80s, the beginning, you know, as a, as a response to the so-called debt crisis, we saw a whole attack coming from the World Bank and the FMI, the, the National Monetary Fund, against communitarian relations, communal forms of land property in different parts of Africa, the whole this big drive to privatizing. Then in the 90s, Latin America, the Zapatista struggle also, both the attack on the commons that come with the neoliberalism, with the 19, the structural adjustment, Part of the, you know, the, the organizational structural adjustment was 
the idea of putting an end legally and, and with violence to communal forms of land property. You know? And then the response, the struggle of indigenous people. It's not an accident in the 90s. You have a whole intensification of struggle. The Zapatistas. I think the Zapatistas also brought the idea of the commons into, the move, into a much broader world movement, right? into the social movement. The anti-globalization movement, I think, was very much affected. And also, I think in the 90s, you have, uh, on the other hand, on the other hand of the discourse on the commons, you know, and because uh, the, all new theories coming from Italian autonomies, the Negri, Hart, about the digital commons, you know, about the internet and um, to be a new forms you know, of um, cooperative you know, work, reconstituting new forms of communitarianism on another level. So you had the digital commons, the land commons, and you know, I've been also doing work around the question of common in reproduction, the work itself, not only in terms of recuperating land, but also in terms of creating new forms of, uh, which also was inspired by things that have been happening in Latin America, you know, the Comedores Populares. So it's, I think, the, the discussion of the commons is coming from two sides, that on one side, the attack on communitarian relation, you know, starting in the 80s, late 70s, and continuing through the present, and the other, the new forms of struggle that have been developing, right? by you know, the, defense, the defense of communal lands, and the defense, and the creation, not only the defense of communal land, but also the creation of new forms of reproduction. I think this is, uh, which I think is really one of the most important things that is happening. <coughs> Yes. yes. And uh, I think it's, we're at a particular moment in the, in the story of the class struggle, which is very decisive. Mm. Because through all this rigmarole about uh, Trump and uh, uh, Johnson Bolsonaro and, and Bolsonaro and all this, is that what's not seen is the fact that capitalism itself is facing a very serious profits crisis. When interest rates reach negative levels, when growth rates reach negative levels, together we are looking at a system that is not on its own terms. We don't have to wait for George Kofensis to say you've got a problem. Uh, this is uh, a, a period when, in fact, it's exactly because there is this crisis that we have a Trump, not the other way around. So I think that, uh, at least in this particular moment, we have a, a serious consequence of the operation of this system. An opportunity, because I think that in a way, if you, if you re recognize that, you also recognize that the alternative, you know, the struggling and hoping that it's going to be a capitalism with a human face, right? The idea of a kind of a capitalism that can implement reforms, that can humanize exploitation. I, it's very much an illusion and that the question of, uh, you know, beginning to organize it in ways that presumes that we have to move, that we have to change the system. They begin to organize along those lines, then it becomes, you know, life and death matter. A matter of, you know, because, um, yeah, the option of a reformist capitalism. Uh, at this point, uh, I think it's out of the question. That's at least the, the way we both in different ways come from. <laughs>
One last question. We've been talking about primitive accumulation, crash struggle, refusal of work, crisis of capitalism in these years, commoning, many fold of work. And you, you've been saying about Bolsonaro and Trump as an expression of actual crisis of capitalism. So what is your reflection or your thoughts on another form of our expression or political expression nowadays in the States on the Green New Deal, of, on the proposal of these socialist young Americans about this the transformation or fair transition, just transition that is emerging also from the union sector. Um, maybe some opinion more on, on, on these days, on the present days. Hmm. Okay. Um, the two parts of the question, one having to deal with... Uh, okay. uh, can you see... Look at me, please. Okay, look at... <laughs> all right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, yeah. The, the part of the question that deals with um, the new enclosures uh, is something that I think is very... Um, the choice of, of terms is not an innocent process, of course. And the reason why the notion of a new enclosure is used is to bring about the recognition that there's a solidarity between the struggles of today and the struggles uh, against capitalism before it was begin, before it had formed itself, and that there was a notion that there were many struggles against capitalism before there was even capitalism. I think this is a, an important point that should be understood because it also lays the foundations for something else. See, the, the idea that uh, we can find a, uh, an alternative to capitalism is uh, when we speak of the new enclosures, we speak not only of capitalism having to uh, destroy the means of the access of workers to the means of production, is uh, very much a recognition that there has been a long-term struggle to repress the, the initial conditions of capitalism to, to exist. So as a consequence, this uh, This terminology, this terminological dispute is important because I think it really brings out the fact that there is that capitalism is not some natural uh, product of historical transformation, but that it has been repressed for many centuries and that uh, there have been various efforts over the history. Or it's been uh, um, more than repressed. Yeah, it's, it's been the attempt to develop in that direction has been uh, um, fought against for a long time and continues to be fought against in terms of new areas, eh? new areas where capitalist relations now are advancing and trying to take over. That's like also the solidarity between the past and the present. Yeah, that's what I, I think it's important politically. And also, just the, from, the, from the heart, I might say, that we recognize our, our own solidarity with those who struggled even before there was capitalism, against capitalism and the existence of another logic. <laughs>
yes. the continuing existence of another logic that they are never able to completely destroy. And uh, at times that we've been using the term commons to bring out this fact that the, the human capacities for being able to organize collectively for the reproduction of, of social life is uh, something that is quite crucial to the development of, of another kind of society. And so I would say that it's a term that I think would be useful and a concept that I think would be useful for our brothers and sisters and, in fact, beyond that, to the living creatures that we now are increasingly taking part in our understanding of the struggles that take place that are, that are in fact, speak to a generation of uh, militants who are now beginning to put on their banners, stop the extinction of species. It's, a, it's an important change that's taking place. The, 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 how you say, the space of solidarity, the extent of solidarity is expanding. Also, yes, with the the animal world and nature and so on, in ways that certainly was not true in the, or at least not in the traditional conception of the class struggle. So, so there was a second part which had to do with what you think about the United States now. What are these alternatives that seem to be coming out from a more institutional space? Well, uh, Green New Deal and <clears throat> yes, the, the, the most of these uh, are attempts to try to fix the problems of capitalism in a way that um, would not violate the essentials of a capitalist society. And uh, I, I know that there, there are very fine militants who are taking up, let's say, the, the, the terminology of a, a new deal. But we must remember that the old new deal was a n never a victory of the proletariat. I think we have to recognize that. It was not, in fact, it was built to escape the confrontation with revolution and revolutionary transformation. So as a consequence, I would say the, the Green New Deal, like I'm not sure what color one would put with the FDR form, recognize put would put together if we put them together we see a particular outcome that uh, is not if that's what we can do at this point in history I would say that it was it was uh, not able, we still are not able, if that's what we have to presumably say is the effort that we, we collectively are together forming for the future of human life on the planet, and not only human life, but beyond that. I would Mm -hmm. like to just point out that a deal in U.S. language 
is a, a, an effort to make an agreement that is somewhat suspicious. I have a deal for you means someone is going to give you something that is somewhat questionable. What is being exchanged? What is that is being exchanged, right, in the deal? Yeah. So if anyone offers you a deal in New York, you better be careful. See what I mean? And uh, I think it would be, uh, as with most of these kinds of transitional claims and demands and formulations, uh, the, uh, one must study them and not dismiss people who are involved in material struggles, but at the same time, I think that the, the terminology of, of new enclosures in the commons is useful for us to continue our recognition. Yeah, for instance, what is the Green New Deal? I mean, for example, what are the green we have seen we know that across the Latin American continent there is a tremendous struggle against the you know, new forms of green energy, you know, the eolic plants and so on. They presumably all is clean, but actually they, in, they provide a tremendous amount of electricity and displacement. Like we know in Mexico, for instance, huge amount of struggle against uh, the creation of these territories full of eolic plants because they are displacing people, uh, they are destroying animals, they are destroying croplands. And so what, what is, and same thing with the green gasoline. I know in Brazil, for instance, a lot, a lot with the green as in Africa, you know, thousands of hectares of land being expropriated in order to create the green plant elephant grass for the green gasoline. So we have to be very, very careful, particularly when the you know, Green New Deal is supposed to create these new economies that are still capitalist economies. And the question is, you know, who? This has been the history of capitalism, right? That you uh, pacify the struggle, right? By responding to the need of a particular sector of the population. You know, whereas uh, hidden are others who have been you know, those are being displaced by the green gasoline. You know? And it was like the New Deal of the, of the 1930s. Most, most African-American workers were not included you know, in, uh, in the New Deal. And, uh, and we are now beginning to see, for instance, I think which is very interesting, you know, there's work that is being done which is showing that before the New Deal, that legalized the union with the Wagner Act in 1935. There was supposed to be a big uh, union victory because the union was recognized, the whole contract system became part of the institution, and workers were not shot at when they went out to demonstrate. Now it's beginning to recognize that before that, you had forms of labor organization that actually dealt with the whole life of the worker, not only with the workplace defined strictly in terms of the production place, but you had type of organization, labor organization that dealt with health, dealt with pension, work accident, and in that, they had very deep roots in the community. You know, and so that, that division that really begins to accentuate between the workplace, which is the only one recognized, and the community, and more and more the community falls out of the moment of struggle between workers and capital. So the struggle between workers and capital becomes isolated, becomes in a way refocused, relocalized in the community, you know, and, and isolated from the, re in, in, the, in, the, in the factories, uh, the places of wage work. 
either all of that we begin to see that perhaps the New Deal was also a way of uh, undermining that kind of forms of organization, which was very powerful. Because when, you know, factory workers went on strike, the whole community worked with them. The whole community went on strike with them, you know, and organized around that. And then it becomes more and more the contract. The union will negotiate, and they pull out the workers in the street, in the square, for that one day, and it becomes a very, it's like a dance, you know, and it's, you know, and everything is exchanged in equal terms. More money, more productivity, more money, more exploitation, etc. You know, and um, so I think uh, that we have to rethink also of that history and the way the, the New Deal has been celebrated as a great working class victory and to see how, in fact, it has redefined. And for instance, another example, what kind of work have been recognized as work in the new labor legislation? Not only left out, you know, reproductive work in the home, but for instance, the New Deal never recognized uh, uh, domestic work done for wages. Domestic workers who work outside the home were catalogued, classified as companions. In the New Deal, right, domestic work done for wages was not, was not recognized. It's only starting in 2000 and more than 2010. The domestic workers in the United States, according to the labor legislation of a number of states, have been recognized as workers and entitled to some union benefits like uh, a limit on the hours of work, vacation, severance pay. Until then, for all the legislation of the 1930s, they were not recognized as workers. So we have to keep that in mind also to put the, the New Deal in perspective. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Yeah.